Welcome all to another episode of Axonar Confidential. I am your host, Alec Peters, and I am joined tonight by uh, my good friend and ex- esteemed colleague, Paul Jenkins. Paul, welcome to your very first Axonar Con- Confidential. I should say first of many, I am sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you tonight and uh, tell everyone a little bit about what we're doing. Yeah, it, it's uh, listen, It's this is going to be an exciting year because there's a lot of great stuff uh, coming down the pipe. And... Um, uh, you know, as many of our fans know, it really kind of all started uh, kind of like this, the, 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 the pre-production heated up when we did Axicon. Um, we've started releasing the videos from Axicon on our uh, Aries Studio Patreon. Yes, I've got to let everyone know, Aries Studio has a Patreon. Please go uh, sign up. Give us a couple bucks, five bucks a month, and uh, whatever you can afford. It supports the studio, but I have to keep mentioning that because Jonathan Lane keeps beating me over the head every time I don't push it, uh, push Aries uh, Studios' Patreon campaign. But uh, so, and you can find all the Axicon videos are being released uh, first uh, and uh, well ahead of everyone else on our Aries Studio Patreon campaign, which we have like almost 200 donors. I think we have 196 donors right now donating $1,800 a month, which is amazing, Paul. I mean, it's just. We, between that and, and the money we're making on YouTube, literally, we are three quarters of the way of paying for the whole monthly nut. And uh, if we do move to a smaller studio right next door, which they're building, which is would be brand new, um, it would all be covered. So pretty exciting. Um, and the bridge, which you have got to come see because you haven't seen the bridge yet. <laughs> the bridge yeah. is amazing. It is it is better than I ever thought it would be. I got to be honest with you. And uh, Dana Wagner... Is, is and James Simpson are just doing an amazing job. You've seen the photos. You got to come over one day. It's just absolutely spectacular. I'm down. I'm down for it, man. I mean, I you know last time I came over there, I think we were sort of in construction and some of it was done, but I hadn't seen anything with any of the pads, any of the the full bridge finished and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, you know, I'm excited to go work over there. So it's gonna be gonna be great once we get going. Yeah, and you know, we talked about. Uh, originally you know a year ago i was like yeah i don't think we're going to shoot on the bridge for the for the you know it's 30 minutes and and now it's like flashback scenes we're shooting on this bridge it's too damn good i mean uh it's just it is fantastic. we were there yesterday and i tell you it they, they they redid all the graphics at the eye level monitors to be similar to the upper monitors which are black backgrounds and you know it, it's funny it was kind of like when we we're talking about the um the matting the floor instead of gray carpet we were putting down black rubber matting and i was like oh maybe too dark nope not too dark and then mm-hmm. we're going with they're changing from colors to black backgrounds on the and i'm like that may be too dark nope still and it's still we keep talking about the comparison of uh for, for the hunt for red october the comparison between what the way the uss dallas looked bright white and beige and, and very bright and the red October, which was dark and black, but everything really popped on the red October. That's what we've been going for. And it's kind of like we, we found a nice middle ground and, uh, damn, you can, you will not, you will definitely be enjoying directing something on that set because it <laughs> well, is, I'm, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be hitting you up to go there quite often. You know, I mean, that's the point is we want to we want to put that thing up on on screen. You know, get that in there. And yeah. there's no way we can't put the bridge on the screen. I'm just, I was doubtful in the past, but no, the way we are, and it's kind of funny. We're so we're so close. Like the kids from you know, we've got three student films have now been shot there, mm-hmm. and um, and when I walked into the bridge yesterday. One of the the kids made their own graphic for one of the upper monitors, and uh, I'll have to pull it down and share it with everyone. And it was really adorable. It was it was kind of cartoony and funny, and had some funny stuff. It was all, but it was awesome, and it was scrolling, and it was just amazing. So, you know, we've got the, the students are filming there now, and you know, it looks amazing. It it just really. And once we're finished, because now we're not now we're not satisfied. Originally, we were just going to have plexities for the certain monitors, but nope, those got to be computer screens. And the astrogator and the pilot console were like, that has got to be a computer screen. We got to, it's got to be animated. It's got to be, right? So we're really kind of like, every time we get closer and closer, we're like, nope, 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 it's got to be better. It's got to be better. So you will, you will love it. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So, yeah, one of the things, one of the things you and I talked about anyway was, 
we're about to go for attention to detail as much as anything else, you know, when we've got some things that we're going to be doing, but attention to detail is important. And, uh, you know, we're looking to bring some pretty strong production value into what we do next. So doing it that way is about right. You know, that's kind of par for the course for us now, right? I, I, you know, I think so. It's wonderful that when people go back, keep, I mean, that people are still, watching. we're approaching 4 million views for Prelude to Axnor on, yeah. on YouTube and people were watching it for their 10th, 12th, 15th time. And, um, it holds up so well because of our attention to detail, you know, yeah. it really does. Okay. Let's talk about you. Um, <laughs> how did we meet? <laughs> tell everyone how we met because I tell that story all the time. You tell that story. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, we were introduced by somebody, you know, and uh, I think it was a great introduction. I mean, um, you know, I, I'll tell you from my perspective, uh, not necessarily exactly how we met, but more like what I felt like when I came in and when we met. I came in to talk to you to some extent and say, hey, man, what you did, you know, this Axonar project, that was great. I mean, I, I basically told you, if you remember, like, this thing was great, man. How did you put that together? You know, well done. I've been in this business for someone close to 30 years now, and I've seen fan films, and I've seen that. And I was a cut above, and I was just really impressed. And I, it, for me, it was like, man, I want to go meet that guy and talk to him a little bit and find out how he did it and what were you thinking and all that stuff. You know, like, you must be crazy, dude. You know, I can't believe I'm you crazy. put that thing together. And you are a little crazy. I am. But I am. you are crazy in a good way, and I, I just – I've always been a person that, you know, I've, I've been in different elements of this industry. I've done a lot of comics, you know, I've done a lot of video games, worked in animation, all this, you know, lots of different things. And to me, um, I've always been close to fans, you know. I've always enjoyed bringing something to fans, whether it be a signing or just, you know, like interacting with fans online. I, I like it because the fans are the people that pay my wages. And... Um, I just found that like what you had done with Axonar was something that I admire. I kind of aspire to that thing. Let's go bring this stuff to fans and, and all of that. So you and I got to, to talk a little bit about it. And we, you know, we talked about potentially working on the script together is where we started out. And, um, and then things escalated. <laughs> <laughs> Why that escalated fast. <laughs> yes, it did. Yes, they did. By the way, I got to mention uh, Dave S. Good gave us, I'm sorry, Dave G Sound, uh, Dave G Sound, five dollars super chat um, said this should be good. Love it. That was before we even got on the air. I, I think <laughs> Dave, you have set a record for the fastest super chat. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Adega Outlaw is on one of our regulars, and uh, All Hail Eccleston Angel, um, uh, who is one of our regulars, uh, who always makes me laugh um, because he always say he always. Uh, in all bold, uh, always says, all hail Alec Peters, savior of the Star Trek universe. So he's <laughs> buttering me up for something, and he's been doing it every single episode. I'm not sure what he's going to... He's going to be asking me for something sometime soon because he keeps buttering me up. But uh, we've, we've got 75 uh, of our fans on right now. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, guys. As always, we hope you like our new frame here that you see, this the, the frame that goes around... Uh, this is a, a, the product of Brian Montgomery of Popcast. And Brian and his brother, Sean, uh, of, who do Popcast, are new partners with uh, Axonar and uh, Real Trek uh, and uh, Aries Studios. We're real excited about having them on board. Um, we did a, a show the other day that he uh, engineered for us. And uh, he's done all this. He's doing all the graphics and everything. And it, it really makes us look... Pfft, a lot more professional. So uh, we're, we're really trying to up our game. So listen, I, it, you know, when John, uh, our fr mutual friend John introduced us and mentioned you, if I'm not mistaken, I don't, I, if I'm not mistaken, my, I was like, that name sounds really familiar. And, uh, and then I looked you up and I was like, oh, that Paul Jenkins. Okay. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, because uh, I, I think you're, you're, best known in the for comics right that is what you're i mean even though you really knocked out of the park with gods of war on the video game front and you worked you were what the number one or two higher uh for uh teenage New mutant ninja turtles when they came kenny kevin eastman yeah technically i was the third person to go work with ninja turtles and this is right when it was beginning to be a toy or a tv show and the thing exploded and i found myself as a 22 year old kid 
stuck in the middle of this stuff. Uh, so I've been involved in this industry for a really long time. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it kind of escalated from there because I went to Marvel when they were in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And uh, the first thing I wrote to them for them was a book called The Inhumans, and it ended up winning an Eisner Award for them. So they were quite happy with me and said, okay, now take everything and fix it. And <laughs> so we kind of helped pull them out and propel them out of bankruptcy a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, that's, that's helped. Um, I actually wrote one issue of a Star Trek book for, for, uh, for Marvel, which I didn't tell you about. You didn't. Now I got to uh, go through. What, it, was it? what issue was it? Do you remember? <laughs> it was called, it was called Star Trek Operation Assimilation and it was about yeah. the Borg. So it was, uh, I, it was in that there. One. And there's actually a funny story behind it. Um, when one of the Romulan characters is, is losing their mind because they're being assimilated and they're saying in their internal monologue, um, I'll never be assimilated, Romulus, forever. And you begin to see their brain break down and actually they are being assimilated and they don't even realize it at the time. Um, and somebody in the production office actually dropped the lettering on the floor and they tried to reassemble it on the page, but they didn't know where it went. So it's actually even more confused than it was intended. And it was absolutely perfect. Like the dialogue <laughs> came out great because someone messed up. It was awesome. So, that, I uh, bet I still have my copy of that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I remember that. that's fantastic so and of course you're you're most well known for wolverine origin which was you know marvel was always like we're never going to tell wolverine's origin story right that's going to be like the big the big secret right and then of course they tell it and yep. but they wisely chose you to tell it um so tell us tell everyone a little bit about that one because it's well, it is really a seminal work I mean, you know, I had had um, a lot of success at Marvel. I think they were quite happy because we had come in and, and sort of done some things that they had not done for a while. Um, you know, they were really struggling. They were in bankruptcy and things things were not going well for them. And so they made the sort of desperate last um, attempt from a creative corporation, which is to come to creators like myself and actually liberate us to write good stuff. Um and, and, you know, I'd done The Inhumans. I'd done a book called The Sentry. I was working pretty hard on Spider-Man, and we were reviving that. And I'd done The Hulk, and we were reviving that. And they asked me to come to an editorial conference, and I sat there with the president. And halfway through the day, um, the guy's, Bill Jemis was the guy's name. Uh, halfway through the day, Bill said to me, why are you scowling? Like, why, why are you, like, annoyed? And I said, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, man. I'm not going to stand on ceremony like you guys are supposed to be the house of ideas. And every time we come up with a good one, you say no. And I don't know why. Uh, so I'm a bit of a punk. And Bill actually agreed with me and said, OK, I get it. You know, like, why? What do you mean? And I said, well, you know, um, take the, you know, take a, uh, the origin of Wolverine. You say you can't do it, but I don't know why you can't do it. If you told his origin story just a little bit, then it would help. Um, to re-energize the character, and then you could mess with that for 10 years. Well, they've been messing with it now for 20. I mean, clearly the origin of Wolverine really helped galvanize that character. Um, all we did was say what his name was and where he came from and, and you know, why he'd forgotten. And the reason he'd forgotten was a good conceit. It was just that he has a healing factor, and, it, you know, he, he heals. And so he had, uh, you know, had a, a traumatic sort of post-traumatic stress uh, event, and his mind had papered over the cracks, and he'd forgotten what had happened. Um, so it made sense and they let us do the book and it went crazy. It was the number one book for like 10 years, you know, it was the number one selling book. Um, so they allowed me to continue to kind of do things. I did civil war with them and all, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, at the time I was really busy in, in game cause I love innovating in game storytelling. Um, so I was, even though I was known for comics, I was more proud to some extent of, of some of the work that we did to change uh, video games, you know, who's your favorite comic character? Um, to some extent, it's the Sentry, the character that I created, because uh, I, I loved that character, and they basically turned it down for many years. Um, and I thought it was perfect for Marvel. It was a, like a Superman for them. But if you recall the way that Stan and Jack and Steve Ditko would do their characters, they would always have a flaw. So Daredevil is blind, and this guy's got this problem, and the Hulk is really angry. And so the Sentry uh, had a mental health issue. He was Superman, but he was schizophrenic. So he wasn't just the Sentry. He was also his, his enemy, the Void. He was both people in, at the same time. And uh, it was perfect for them. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. I think the one that I most like, the character that I identified with most was Spider-Man. I ended up writing him for like six years. So, you know. All right. <clears throat> Still have your comics from when you were a kid? 
Well, I didn't have comets when I was a kid, actually, to be honest. Oh. I didn't really have them because I grew up on a farm in that's a better story like how i grew up is more interesting i grew up you know the back end of nowhere as a little kid in the middle of a farm uh so we vaguely saw comics uh saw a few marvel comics but you know we didn't see any any of that kind of stuff uh, cause we, did, we didn't have any money so yeah. and comics were back when you were a kid probably the british comics were weekly right and they were done on newsprint that's right yeah so we dealt with that and we would get these american reprints i actually wasn't really a marvel guy i like the old uh, ec comics like the you know, astounding fantasy, amazing science, and, uh, uncanny tales, all of that stuff. I loved that stuff when I was about six years old. I was reading some really dark material, but I thought it was amazing. So that's probably what sparked me in terms of comics. Wow. Wow. Okay. So um, what was the, what's like, have you written anything comic wise lately or is, have you, are you totally out of that? Yeah, no, I, I do a little bit. I mean, I like to do creator own stuff, right? Because I'm really big in the creator side of it. So for me, um, you know, at the moment in comics, I, I do much less because, um, uh, you know, I, I like to do creator own stuff. And so I'm, I'm working with a company called Aftershock. Um, I've got like three or four series I've done with them. Uh, the latest one's called Beyonders. And it's about like the, the biggest treasure hunt in the world. But a kid that thinks that conspiracy theories may be connected, and he finds out that every single conspiracy theory in the world is connected. So it's a really cool oh, that's book. That's cool. Like, uh, I get to do the kind of thing that I want to write now, and it seems to be much more successful. I mean, creators that are doing the thing they love is a lot more productive than creators that are sort of trying to run through the mill of, of these big creative corporations. You know? Wow. Okay. The, that, that's interesting. Um, all right. So st when did you become a Star Trek fan? Uh, so I was first exposed to Star Trek um, when I was a little kid, and this was the original series. And these things were replayed on the BBC um, once a week as if it was a first-run show um, because the BBC is very archaic. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And we call it. Auntie Beeb, like Auntie BBC. Like it's literally our, our favorite relative, and we just kind of stick with her a little bit. And in Britain, it's such a strange thing. It's like a government-run thing, so you have to pay a, a television license um, to be able to have the British Broadcasting Company deliver to you for free. It's the strangest kind of concept, but it's very British. And uh, so I, as a little kid, uh, I did not. we did not own a television. Um Again, I, you know, I just lived in the back end of nowhere, but we used to go on holiday to our grandparents' house and they loved to watch television and we would get to see the original Star Trek. Um, and I remember that that evening was always a good evening because it was the original Star Trek, the original Hawaii Five-0. Oh, um, love that so show. Those, those are great. And so those two shows have two of the best opening sequences. Oh, the history of television. Uh, the original Hawaii Five O, if you recall, it had like a hula dancer and Steve McGarrett standing on a window, and they did the smash cut into him with a helicopter yeah. shot. And um, and then every week you would see the guys like paddling really hard, and my grandfather would say the same thing: "They haven't got very far." Every <laughs> week, it was, it was the best joke, and we would crack up laughing. And then right after that, we were excited because Star Trek would come on, and my brother and I, our favorite thing was to to spot where the ship was coming from in space. So we'd stand there and we'd go, like, it's coming from top left, you know, and then it would come from bottom right. Like, oh, man, I'm, we never actually realized that you probably could have guessed the sequence after a while. But we, you know, we were so entranced and it was for two little kids out from a farm that never see television. Uh, it's funny that even in those days, it could be really magical. You know, we could watch it and just love that show, you know. Did you ever see Wild Wild West? The Wild Wild West, you mean the TV show? Yeah. Uh, we didn't get that. Ah, I don't, no that way. Is, yeah, so when you talk about the great title sequences, TV title sequences, Hawaii Five-0, of course. Um, Wild Wild West is another one of, you know, I think that the top three of all time. It's a fantastic because great titles. And I, I will li literally throw Game of Thrones in there. The, I, I really think Game of Thrones title sequence is amazing great title sequences have to have great great visuals and great great music and that's a that's a tough one but uh, uh wild wild west is amazing um yeah. and uh yeah. so anyway talk about those things um okay yeah. so let's talk axonar 
Um, oh, by the way, I got to yep. mention Tracy Larson gave us a $5 super chat. Tracy, thank you. We appreciate it. Anything you guys give us is always a bonus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, oh, I see Lynn Marie pa uh, Panzerino is on. Uh, uh, thank you. Michael Carter is on. I, uh, some of our great. Uh, yes, Eccleston Angel uh, loves the Wild Wild West, a great classic TV show. Yeah, I mean, there are some just great classic. T Wild Wild West is one of them. I, first season of Lost in Space, that's another great, uh, great one. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll tell you another thing, Alec. Uh, when you're in Britain, right, you get this strange sense. Obviously, I came to live here, and I, I love it here. Um, but I was really – I wasn't sure what was going to happen when I stepped off the plane because all of your cops had this, like, crazy persona. So you got some dude called McLeod that would ride through San Francisco on a horse. Central Park. <laughs> McLeod was in New York. I don't know where he was, but yeah, all yeah. I know this guy was, like, dry, running around somewhere, right? We had, um, we had um, the, the Ironsides, the guy who had the... Raymond Burr? Raymond Burr, yeah. Who was in he the wheelchair? wheelchair? And we had a guy in a Flasher Mac, that was Columbo, and we would see all these replays of these old shows, and they were brilliant, but I was like, man, I can't wait to go to America one day, because like everyone's got a gun, everyone's mental, all their cops are crazy. Uh, and then I got here and found out it was all completely true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed it is. Columbo is just ah, oh, one of the great TV characters of all time. Just yeah. you know, Columbo is one of those shows where a brilliantly written character meets a brilliant actor. Yeah, and in the role they were right. The, 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 you know, it's so I funny because. Say. If, I always ahead. thought Columbo was so great because he would squeeze the bad guy. He would sort of look at him and say, well, sir, you know, I just want to point out that maybe by that the thing way, said, By yeah. the way, let me just ask by you. By the way, well, well, before I go. <laughs> absolutely twist his foes into a pretzel. I love that guy. You always waited for that. He goes, oh, thank you, thank you. And then, and then he turned around, oh, by the way, by the way. And you were like, now he's going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Man. Yeah, that was that was a great show. Um, oh, we got another. Uh, let's see. What do we have? We have another couple of... Um, uh, Eccleston Angel, $2. Uh, oh, Eccleston Angels is a girl. Of course you are. How could I not know that? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so I'm sorry that you had to spend $2 on Super Chat to tell me that, but thank you so much. You're, uh, you, we love you. Uh, and right, Sublet, four ninety nine Super Chat, thank you so much. Um, we, we have great fans. We have great regulars, Paul, in the, in the, in the chat, if, if you read the chat at all. Um, so thank you, thank you all. And now, now we've just gotten started on talking about classic television and what the great shows <laughs> are. Um, another great, since this is going to be another great title sequence, which you will appreciate. One of the other, I think, one of the great title sequences in television history, The Prisoner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was crazy. That was great. You that know, those classic TV shows. Like one of the things that we have to look at is, and it's something that's sort of like driven my career, Alec. I think. Look at the simplicity of it. Right. Uh, you know, simple is good. And I think that we get overly convoluted at times. There is a lot of simplicity about a lot of those old shows, you know, like uh, crime of the week. You know, the crime of the week is great. You set it up, you solve it. You wonder what's going to happen. You can do all of that in like a one hour show, a uh, half hour show. You know, you look at the we were talking about the original Star Trek shows. You know, you look at the way that show was made. There's some super simple stories um that i think you know we kind of lost after a while you know we didn't we didn't always have that and uh you know to me i think i think you you kind of miss that simplicity um uh, and and that simplicity is something that we should always aspire to even if we're making something complex i know it sounds like a contradiction but we got to make sure that we like put a story forward that people understand and, and let's say you're not a star trek fan you know our job is to make sure that you become one because you watch something that we make you know yeah absolutely and <laughs> to be bopper 25 dollars canadian super chat thank you very much i'm currently watching an old british sci-fi tv show called ufo and i just love it <laughs> I wonder if Mr. Jenkins ever saw it and what he thinks of it. Yes, UFO. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, like, who's this? Uh, whoever that is, you have great taste. Yes. Yeah. So, madam. <laughs> Uh, that show is brilliant. <laughs> UFO was another real classic. You know, that was one. We, we, in Britain, 
we tried to do the sort of American thing, you know. Um, we had shows like Thunderbirds, you know, the one with the puppets. Sure. The original sure. one. That thing what was I, so All exciting. those okay. Jerry Anderson ones. I love all, all of the them. Jerry Anderson stuff. Yes, absolutely. Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. Um, you know, one of the things about, okay, so we talked about opening title sequences. And I think if you want to put the number one up there for me, it's, it's literally that Thunderbird show. There's nothing more exciting. Brilliant. That Absolutely. is a brilliant Thunderbirds are go. I mean, yeah. just, you know. it literally counts down like five, four. Three, yes, two, three. I know. And Which, for us, it's in an American accent. So it must be legit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, what was your favorite Thunderbird? Uh, so as a kid, I did not want to be called Paul. I literally wanted to be called Scott because Scott Tracy the pilot Thunderbird 2, like I wanted to be named after a wooden puppet. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I was a big fan of Thunderbird 3. I was like, the, uh, because it was the 60s and America was all about the space race. I wanted to be in the Thunderbird that was going to space. Right? Uh, well, no, Thunderbird 3 wasn't in space. Thunderbird 5, sorry, a little point of order right there. You mean the dude stuck up in space? No, 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 no. I mean Thunderbird 3, the red oh, the one, one that the went that was, to the, yeah. Th yeah. Was Gordon in Alan. Thunderbird 5? Gordon was in four, I think. I can't remember now. I uh, know Alan, the blonde haired kid, was in four, the one that was like submarine. And then the poor guy that was stuck up in space. And I always felt bad for that. I guy. always felt bad for him, too. <laughs> like, dude, that guy needs a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow, that sucks. You're just stuck up in space. You know, not, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. but, but Thunderbirds. And then right after that, okay, so Jerry Anderson was the most profound influence on my youth. Oh, yeah, um, cool. Other than comic books, I mean, on TV, more than Star Trek, because Star Trek was one show. Yeah. Jerry Anderson, I started by watching Fireball XL5 right. and Stingray, Thunderbirds, yep. Captain Scarlet, and then Captain he goes, Scarlet right? Was Captain Scarlet was brilliant. You're missing Wait. one. You're missing one really important one. Well, Earlier, he did Joe 90. Joe 90 is the one, man. Uh, Joe 90 is made. Never saw Joe 90. I'm not even sure we had it. You know, here, because all of all of that stuff was on Channel 9 in New York, I think. And I never, so I never saw Joe 90. That was a, just, that was a little earlier, uh, you know, because I kind of saw him when they were first coming to the United States. But uh, I got, listen, I raised my godson, uh, not my godsons, my nephews on uh, Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. They they got it all, uh, you know, yeah. back in the 90s when they were growing up. They were getting, a, I guess, was it even DVD? I guess it was videotapes or DVDs or whatever it was. But, oh, yeah, that, that stuff. And then, so then, this is getting us back to, to to Be Bopper's UFO. Then he goes, and after Captain Scarlet, he does UFO. He goes to live action. Yeah. Does UFO. And before he does Space 1999, he does... An amazing movie, which I hope you've seen because it's one of my favorite. He does Doppelganger, known here yeah. in the United yeah. States as Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, point of order again, right? So there was some live action in Captain Scarlet because every time they would cut into a hand, they didn't want to do a puppet hand. Yep. So they put a human hand reaching for something yep. and then they'd cut back out and it would be back to Captain Scarlet. <laughs> I know. I never <laughs> bought that. <laughs> oh, please. It was great. It wasn't the puppets that were taking me out of the, the verisimilitude. It was the hand. That's right. I agree. I agree. But it just brilliant, amazing mind. And Space 1999 was brilliant. It was a great show. And, you know, those guys were a content factory and they were so brilliant. You know, they made amazing stuff. So that kind of shaped me as well, man. I'm, I'm like you. I just, Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds are two of the most exciting shows that I've ever seen, you know? There's, and they hold up so well for kids, especially. Yeah. They, they do. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, a few people were talking about MASH. Of course, MASH, huge here in the United States. One of the first TV shows actually to have a final episode. Uh, and also, obviously, the inspiration for Prelude to Axanar for the whole documentary style. Uh, if yeah. you have a chance, you, you MASH fans there, make sure you go um, and watch the episode called The Interview, which is the black and white episode done uh, newsreel style. That was the inspiration for Prelude to Axanar. Uh, and how we how we shot it all. So uh, thank you very much. So you guys are on a roll. Our fans are on a roll talking about their favorite shows. Uh, <laughs> Lost in Space, of course, gets some. That, I guess that was the other big one was Irwin Allen when I was a kid. You know, in the United States, you had Lost in Space. You had Voyage to the Bottom Sea, Land of the Giants. That that was kind of he was kind of like the American version of 
uh, of Jerry Anderson. Um, but uh, yeah, so you would, you would also see some whack stuff. Um, you know, we would see the banana splits as kids. Oh, it's a, yeah. it's, I don't know where that came from. It might have been Canadian. It might have been American. Yeah, it was American. That was uh, what. Uh, Oh, what's the seals? In, no, seals of Croft. Uh, Marty Croft. Oh, uh, was, yeah, Mar Sid and Marty Croft. Yeah, Sid and Marty Croft. Was, right. Yeah. So yeah. those people, I think, before that had made HR Puff and stuff. Yes. Um, yes. And HR Puff and stuff was this crazy show with puppets, kind of, and little Jack Wilde, the kid, and so those things. The, the one thing about that is there's so many of those things that are like inventive and cool and fun and interesting. So, you know, we look at that and they, that kind of shapes my television viewing because I didn't get to see a lot of it. When I did, I was really selective about what it was that I wanted to watch. And it was all the things that were that exciting, you know. Oh, my God. I forgot earlier on, by the way, I forgot Kojak as well because Kojak oh. was a real detective. That guy was great. Telly Savalas, who loves you, baby. Yeah, because the American thing for us was like a guy with a New York accent that's bald and eats lollipops. <laughs> <laughs> that guy is definitely a detective. Stavros. <laughs> yeah. Stavros, yeah. That's right. Yeah, no, no. And, uh, that, that Starsky, one, that... Starsky and Hutch, man. That car was just amazing. Oh, yeah. I know. And, oh, Starsky and Hutch is another great one, right? That yeah. is so 70s. That That's so, like, early 70s, that show. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it really is. Um, we had a couple people mentioning uh, Time Tunnel was another Irwin Allen show. Yeah. Right. Time Tunnel. But yeah. uh, before... Um, and then uh, Matthew Gaudet mentions that the main title of Lost in Space was done by John Williams, which oh. was, oh. that's an amazing, amazing title, uh, title song. Yeah. It uh, is. Uh, I'm wondering if, if they also did, uh, not, not just a time tunnel. What was the one, the show that came on about, it was like, a, it was uh, the, the Bermuda Triangle or something. Where they would go through like, they keep hopping through the Bermuda Triangle. They go through like, it wasn't a time tunnel. It was a very similar show. I don't know who did that, that but that was... In that, yeah. in that day, in like 60s? Yeah, around about then. Maybe 70s as well, maybe in their time. But we, we would see that stuff, and we were just like, this, you're like, I'm going to America. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you made it. We're glad you yeah. made it. So that, yeah. that's all. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, Dave, yeah. David Soul and Starsky and Hutch, someone's saying, uh, David Soul and... Paul Michael Glazer. Paul Michael Glazer. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. And... Uh, Sliders, yeah, Sliders is like late eighties, nineties, nineties maybe. Uh, yeah. is, is another one, but but a good one. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, Quantum Leap, yeah. Now, now everyone's just on. Now you're too old. We're reminiscing about the olden days. Don't give me this newfangled stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, someone hi from Australia. Hey, Clint Jeffrey is from Australia. He's asking uh, any thoughts on Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, and I'll let you go first. Yeah, you know, I, I knew uh, an actor, uh, a guy called Loftus Burton, that had played on the bridge and um, back in Britain, and um, that show was was kind of cool. It was the, the dumbest premise of all time, like the moon's going to go that fast and no one's going to get smashed up. It was okay, but nerds everywhere, I think, had to like really suspend their disbelief that this was happening. Um, but that being said, you know, it had this formula that we recognize, right? It was story of the week, alien of the week, concept of the week you know this stuff you can tell where they got their their inspirations from but they did a great job their stories were cool they were interested you know i yeah. love that show uh and matthew cadet also says space above and beyond yes and uh i i probably matthew if you've tuned in before you know i i shouldn't have to show you this but i'll show it to you i'll show it to you anyway that there you go space above and beyond right next to the garth visor costume is colonel mcqueen's costume from space above and beyond so uh uh there you go let me rearrange my now that i screwed up my camera here um <laughs> there we go uh so yeah I, you know space 1999 here here's the thing we didn't really talk get into ufo by the way do, ufo lots of hot chicks let's let's face it lots of hot chicks <laughs> on ufo all those little skimpy moon base outfits were just out of control um but do you remember the, the character Virginia Lake? She was like the intelligence officer. Yeah. Uh, who was the actress who played her? Um, let me Google that. The, the great thing about that, I, and I, it's my old ages. Uh, here, we got, oh, the, oh. Uh, let's see. Oh, Wanda Ventham. Now, do you Wanda know who Ventham. Wanda Ventham wow. is? 
No, I did not know that. I didn't know who that was. Who's okay. that? Wanda Ventham uh, is, um, what's his name? Doctor Strange. Who's Doctor Strange? The actor. Uh, Steven. Oh, you mean. Um, uh, I can't believe the new one. What's his name? He's Sherlock Holmes. I, I, yeah, a guy that played uh, in the film about the Enigma Code. But he's got like a crazy ass name, right? So he's, he's the Brit. Yes. Uh, ben, oh, um, Benjamin Cumberbatch. Benedict. Benedict Cumberbatch. Batch, yes. He yeah, couldn't ben be more British if he tried, could he? Yeah. Well, um, Wanda Ventham is Benedict Cumberbatch's mom. Oh, wow. Yeah. How's that? The first time I heard that, I was like, wow, that's that's crazy. So, yeah, there's a little <laughs> The World is Small. Um, how, do you know these, how do you know these things? I know uh, too much time on the internet, I'm, I'm guessing. So we could talk about classic TV forever. Uh, ben, thank you for thank you for that. Lynn Marie uh, mentions uh, that it's uh, Ben to Cumberbatch. By the way, you guys, if you uh, if you're texting us, if you're messaging us in the comments section, uh, just know that um, uh, if you cuss, <laughs> we have to edit. We have to approve your your comments, so you may not see it for a little while uh here so um Dan dana says my nerd card has been revoked well because i forgot benedict cumberbatch's name come on that's an easy one the fact that i knew that wanda ventham was his mom that is x that is huge dana we have dana our our bridge uh bridge concierge the construction coordinator uh bridge graphics guru is uh is watching us tonight so thank dana uh uh thank you very much for joining us um <laughs> Uh, Doctor Strange was way better than Spider-Man or Captain America. Oh, I, I don't know. Not better than... Oh, 1980s Doctor Strange. Okay. Yeah, there were some bad Marvel movies on TV in the 1980s. Um, yeah. All right, so let's talk about Axanar. Let's get... Because that's why we're here. Let's get back to talking about Axanar. Um, so, um, you read the script, right? After we, First of all, we need to tell everyone. We, we met... we. Did we meet at the taco place to start? Strange Taco? Is that where we... Yes. So yeah, we, that's right. We went there. Right. So we, we went from Strange place. Taco, which is a, this amazing yeah. taqueria in, in Lawrenceville. Um, we go from Strange ta Taco, and we have tacos. And we're getting on, right? And we're like, well, let's let's have a drink. So we get, went to the roof bar at McRae's, right? So we yeah. go to the roof bar right across the street at McRae's. has a great roof, and it was a beautiful day. So we, we go up there, and we're drinking because he's British, so I have to drink, right? And so we're drinking, and uh, and then we wind up having coffee late at night at Universal Joint. So we spent six hours together our first – that's how well we got along. That's that's right. I think sometimes when you meet people that you get on with, you go, that's easy. Like easy conversation. We both share the same ideas. Um you know, I was just, I was very enamored with Axanar. And so I, I, I don't really have much of a fan mentality for things, you know. Um, I love dealing with fans and I, I, there's probably three or four people that I like to meet, you know, like I, w I wish I'd met Neil Armstrong. I wish I'd met Ali when he was alive, the Dalai Lama. And then the, the list gets really short, you know. Like I don't really mind about that kind of thing. I deal with actors a lot and I don't think there's that much in me that's fanish. But to the extent that I am a fan, you know, I kind of said to you, man, you know, I'm just full of admiration for what you guys did in making that first action. I just thought it was great. And um, it doesn't really matter if you're a big lifetime Star Trek fan or not. Uh, that's great. Well done, you know. And so I think we hit it off about that. And we got to talk about story. I think that's where we started off. And you talked to me about, you know, where we were at with the, or where you were at at the time, you know, with the story for Axanar and what was going on and some of the things that had been happening around the project. And, um, you know, we talked about maybe looking at the script together. Um, and that was where we started, I think. Yeah. And uh, and, and as I always say, you know, the, uh, Prelude to Axanar is the product of a lot of great people that worked on it. I mean, uh, three, four dozen people worked on worked on Prelude to Axanar. So there, there was a lot of really good people. Whether it was costumes, Kirk Cox uh, did a great, great job, um, or it was the makeup team, or it was the actual crew the day of the shoot. Or you know, there were just a lot of really good people doing a lot of really good work. So you, you, you know, you always focus on that. You know, my biggest job as producer is putting together a great team. That's the whole key. 
right? Um, you know, I have I may be the face of Axonar. It may be my project. I may have created Axonar, whatever. And but it only happens when you put together an amazing team and and people who are dedicated and and uh, and passionate about your project. And um, I think the thing. I, th I think the thing, the difference this time in the way we're crewing Axonar, I would say, is in the past it was always about passion. You you chose people based on passion. Now it's passion, but you better be a professional as well because I'm sick of dealing with the bullshit, right? I'm sick of yeah. dealing with the people who promise you to, to do shit and then they never do it. That's... <laughs> Do we have to do we have to edit your language right there, sir? No, no, no. This is my show. I can say whatever the fuck <laughs> I want. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, so yeah, that's it. But again, it's putting together a great team now. As we start getting it, I'm back into talking to the, you know, costumes. I'm back to talking to to makeup. I, you know, there's you're putting that together again, and uh, and that for me is what's great. What's fun is 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 having really smart, dedicated people like you. You know, and and then putting you together with Mark Edward Lewis, with Bing Bailey, with Jeff Barklage, all these, you, you know, and then as a producer, you just kind of step back and let you guys do your thing, right? You know, my it, it, that's like, oh, my job's done here. <laughs> you guys go do yeah. your go do your thing. I'll tell you one thing that I the thing that I remember most from our first conversation about Axonar. Once we concluded that we were going to work together, you said to me, if I recall, you said, I want to make sure that we can bring to the fans, right, um, that same level of quality. Yeah. And I said, if you recall, why don't we bring an improved level of quality? With all due respect to the amazing thing that you guys have done, our goal is to go upwards and continue, you know, to keep building upwards. Um, anything that we can identify about the first acts and R that, that we want to uh, change or, 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 you know, bring up, then let's keep working towards improvement. And that was something that seemed significant to both of us. You know, it's not resting on your laurels. It's making the next thing better than the last thing, you know? Well, right. Right. You, you know, there's that great, uh, first of all, why wouldn't you try and make it better? Right. Yeah. I'm not trying to do the same. And, also, this is the Battle of Axonar, right? I, this is a pretty important thing. And, uh, you know, there's... Plus, listen, there's so many reasons to make the next two episodes better than Prelude to Axonar. Yeah. I mean, because, listen, if they were as good as Prelude to Axonar, we'd be happy. Right. Everyone would be happy, right? But, fuck that shit. I want it to be so damn good. You know, CBS behind closed doors where no one can see them is banging their head on a table going, why the fuck did we just hire Alec instead? You know, that's what yeah. I want. I want it to be so damn good that, I mean, listen, right now, if you go on to the, our YouTube channel, the number one comment that you see over and over and over and over is, why didn't CBS hire these guys rather than the team that's making Discovery, right? You see that all the time. And which is a wonderful compliment, where which we're humbled by, right? That that fans think that highly a, a, of us. But that's the goal, right? That is, the goal is to be so freaking good, just like Prelude was. When Prelude came out, it redefined what a fan film was. Right. Nothing quite like that had come out in, in Star Trek fan films, and you know, and since then you've got him. It just kind of like Batman Dead End did ten years before Sandy Clara's movie. I mean, that really redefined fan films. Um, just like Richard Hatch's second coming of Battlestar Galactica did 10 years before that. Yeah. You know, the, in 1998, he released that, I think. Right? You know, so there's always this evolution. And you it's you want to better yourself. And there's that old saying, a man's reach must exceed his grasp. Mm -hmm. Right? That's We're always shooting for bigger and better things. And that's hopefully what, what we do. Hey, you know, in Coaching Volleyball, we always have a saying you improve by substitutions. You don't, you don't take someone out because they're doing poorly. You put someone in because they can do better. You're always, and that's what we have to do. We just need to, to be better, which ultimately is the only part of making the next two episodes that's daunting to me. I, I, I'll, I'll cut you off there, man, because you, know, you and I have had this conversation a bit. I'm never afraid to make things, right? Oh, like, yeah. So I, I took over Hellblazer, uh, when I first was writing comics, Hellblazer is a book that's about this character, John Constantine, and it's very um, 
prestigious in the creative community in comics. And when I took over Hellblazer, I had never written a comic in my life. And I was handed this book and people said to me, you know, aren't you afraid of, of working after Garth Ennis, who had had a really successful um, run? Of course. And then when I took over Spider-Man, they were in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They were going out of business and they said, aren't you afraid? Aren't every Spider-Man story has ever been told has been told. To which my response was, how on earth could I be afraid? Like it's comics. We're making great stuff. Like what are you, what are you going to be afraid of? So I don't look at it that way, man. I look at it as if we have a great platform to work on. And, you know, we've already got this great platform to draw from. Um, and so that's what we did. We looked at where you were at with the prelude scripts and what the, you know, you had been through some stuff, but I was lucky. I hadn't been through that stuff. I hadn't been through any issues with CBS. I hadn't been through any any blowback from any fans or people that were frustrated. Um, whatever was happening with Axar, Axanar, I hadn't had that negative experience or anything difficult so i was mr positive and i could just walk in and say let's go make something awesome like i'm not worried about the rest of that stuff i care about our craft and what it is that we make and i know that once we had a chance to redo those scripts those scripts are in a great place yeah i love those scripts they're going to be so i think when people see the way that those stories play out and obviously we're not going to give it away um to the fans and i really appreciate everybody sort of tuning in and, and sort of writing to us and all that stuff. But while we won't give it away, I can certainly, I, f I feel comfortable in kind of explaining what you and I went through in that process, which is, okay, let's take a look at some of the things that I think are important. You know, the character of Garth, the people, how are we going to frame the people? How are we going to show that those people were there? What are we going to from? What are some of our influences in the style that we're going to make the project with? Um, as you know, I was really big into the world at war, um, like, you know, war documentaries. I've watched 50 war documentaries since you and I decided to, to do this project because I want to know how those war documentaries feel. And I come from a family, uh, you know, military family, and a lot of my family have lost their lives in, in a, lot of, a lot of the wars. And, and I look at a project like this and I say, I'm going to pull from that. I want our people to have been there. If they went through the Battle of Axanar, they're going to have been through the Battle of Axanar. And, and it's not just a matter of the amazing effects that we're going to bring in. This is going to revolve around the people that were there and what it felt like to be at this battle and how momentous it was, how it changed history. That's how we're going to approach this project. And once we got into that mode, that's when I think we really pulled, you know, some magic out of the hat, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I, I, uh, I'm totally excited about it because I listen. It's you always want um, you want opportunities to 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 show what you got, right? You always want to. to it's just like you know when I'm in coaching. It's like, wow, now I've got an opportunity to take a team and and mold it and shape it and and see what we can do. That's that's what we're here for, right? Um, I always <laughs> get a kick out of these idiots who think. Who say, oh, you're, well, you're never going to make Axnar. Really? I'm not going to make... Why would I not make Axnar? One, there's nothing more fun than what we're doing right now in making Axnar. Um, it is... Uh, the filmmaking process was... As much as I've loved my other jobs that I've had, whether it's been prop works or the auction works, my technology company, or coaching, you know, which I'm, I, I had a lot of success at, filmmaking is the most fun thing. It, you know, it's it's because it's fun from every step of the process is is different. Creation, yeah. coming up with the idea, writing the first script, revising the script, getting into pre-production, creating costumes and this and that, shooting it, getting into the edit room. There's all these different amazing processes along the line. Everyone's different than the last one. and But everyone is really cool and interesting. And at the end, you make this thing whatever you know whatever your your creation is i mean you know like it or not you're the guy who gave wolverine his origin story and they'll probably be on your tombstone right yeah <laughs> exactly you know i saw a comment i was looking in the, the chat as we're talking and uh s voigt who i'm going to call out now hi how you doing um made a comment that i am very high on right so the comment is uh, effects can only improve on great writing and acting and directing Effects alone are lipstick on a pig, right? I'm not, I'm not so sure about the second half of that, but I will say that one of the things that I find important about special effects and all the stuff that we're going to be able to do for the show 
Um, I, I want effects because they help tell the story and I don't want them for any other reason. So we're not throwing effects in to, to make our story look good. You know, we're going to make our story amazing. And then what we're going to do after that is we're going to use the effects to help tell our story. So they don't deserve to uh, appear on screen. They don't deserve to exist unless they're helping us move our story forward. So I actually really agree with that comment. Yeah, well I, done. I agree. Uh, let's catch up on some super chats. Dave G Sound again, five dollars. It's <laughs> back when I was I, I dropping the f bomb. He said it's your show and you can say whatever the f you want. <laughs> Kudos, really. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Yeah, because you know I, I tend not to cuss unless you watch the next video we're going to release. But um, uh, but in real life I cuss like a sailor. Um, Michael Canole, four ninety nine. I want a bobblehead of a CBS exec in an Axonar base. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. We uh, would agree. Uh, let's see. I think there was another one. Lee Sully, my good friend Lee Sully. We need to see Captain Garth's intelligence. He saw something that made him legendary. I don't disagree with you. You know, the, the whole thing there, Lee, about Garth is how do you make him uh, legendary without making him... Um, caricature or being obvious right i think i think the whole thing is you you've got and and we'll i'll let paul talk to this after i say with garth it's always been about making him making him an unlikely hero because you got your captain kirk you got picard right we've got all these kind of stereotypes for captains cisco love him you know he's my favorite family man which is what i love about him um, father of a, you know, raising his his son by himself. You got Janeway. You had to make Garth different, and the way I decided to do is make him an unlikely hero. Like he didn't want to be a hero. He didn't want to be a war hero. So um, that is the key, I think, to to making Garth different. So Paul, I'll let you take it away. <clears throat> okay, so so this is one of the conversations that you and I had. I had an idea for it, right? If you recall, and I, I called you up and said, "Man, listen, let me let me now that I know this project a little better, let me pitch something at you." Now I'm not going to tell everybody what that is. That's for them to see once we put the film out. But uh, what I will say is that uh, I felt that we have to want to go to like. There's a reason why everybody wanted to go to battle with that guy. You know, why were they behind Garth? What, why? What was it important about him? What was it that he could do or that he represented that every single one of the people on his on his ship would say, I'm going to battle with that guy. I'm doing it for you. know, why did people hand him this responsibility? We talked it through. I pitched you an idea. And it was really the idea was, what is it that makes that guy special? And we came up with something that I really believe in. And that's something that we put into the script and we're going to really push. It's very much you know, the approach that we're taking is story is everything. The characters, the story, that's everything. And then the rest of it drapes off of that skeleton. So, um, you know, I think that we have something amazing and I'm looking forward to, I'm, I can't wait to make that project, you know? No, neither can I. I yeah, I, neither can I. It, because this is what they're going to write on my tombstone. A <laughs> guy who created yeah. Axonar. Yeah. You know, that's just it. Um, Michael S. Carter, one of our good and loyal fans, said, Hey guys, Paul and Alec, what's your favorite war movie? Uh, World War One, World War Two, etc., that have influenced you with items in Axnar? Well, Axon I can talk about that for like three hours. Oh so I'm going to let you talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll do a special right. show. Michael S. Carter, we will do a special show just on Alec talks about war movies and the influence on Axnar. All right. So I will tell you some war movies that are going to influence Axanar. Absolutely. First of all, being of Welsh descent, number one is going to be Zulu. Okay? Because you've got a bunch of people standing up for something that seems impossible. And the way that that story unfolds, and if, if none of you have ever seen it, uh, Zulu is, for Welsh people, that's, uh, that's Braveheart, you know? Um, Braveheart would be another one I'd pull from, you know? Um, you, you can, it is a war movie. I mean, it's very much, um, it's very much about doing something against the odds, you know, uh, for Zulu, you know, the, the actual historical thing behind it was at Rourke's Drift in the Boer War and, 
there were maybe 130 Welsh guards and the Zulus had literally massacred about 1,500 uh, British soldiers the day before and there were 4,000 of them coming towards this tiny little place called Rourke's Drift and there were maybe 120 Welsh guard. And, and one of the things that's most impressive about that is that when the battle was over um, and the Zulus retired, uh, they were really full of admiration for the Welsh guard. Uh, the, in the history of the British military, there have been maybe... 150 Victoria Crosses, which is the highest medal for valor ever awarded, and 11 to 12 of them were given at Rourke's Drift. So it's an amazing film. It's also an amazing moment in history. Um, I look at that. I look at um, I look at Gallipoli because I think Gallipoli is beautiful. And there's an element of this thing that, that I really will hope to bring as a director. Um, I hope we brought it in the writing. This is this is about how we feel, you know, this is about how it feels to go to war because as much as we are dealing with starships, um, I'm going to pull, uh, as a director and the way that we pull this in together and the discussions I have with the talent, you know, I want to show my grandfather who was on a merchant Navy ship in, in the second war and got sunk, you know, and he never talked about it. These things were hard for him. You know, three of my great grandfathers were killed in the First World War. I think there's a lot to pull from that. You know, that, that war is not war. War never determines who is right. It only ever determines who's left. And the futility of war is something that I think is really interesting for us to talk about as we talk about uh, this project. But one of the things that I think I want to bring to it, Alec, is is the idea that even though war can be so difficult. It is necessary at times because look at what they accomplish, you know, from this battle. Um, those are two that spring to mind. What about you? Um, well, you know, listen, we it, it, you start off with, you can talk about your favorite war films, but um, I, I always think that war films um, ha have a lot of meaning. And it really t depends what you're looking for in a war film. Where you just want an action flick? Do you want a historical recreation? Or do you enjoy the personal stories? I mean, listen, Patton is one of my favorite movies. Da -da -da. There's George C. Scott's costume from Patton with his helmet. Um, Patton's one of my favorite movies. And uh, it's because it's a story. It's the story of George C. Scott's version of, of General George S. Patton, right? It's his take on this character, and um, which is a lot different than the actual Patton. The actual Patton had a really high voice, and, and George C. Scott didn't. But I love I love Patton because it's about this man, this flawed and fascinating man, and um, you know, so that's a war story, right? Um, is it an influence on Axtar? Hmm. I don't know because it's a, it's a, that's a personal story about this one character who's unlike anyone really in, 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 uh, Axtar. I, I would say probably because I, um, you know, I look at the generals like, um, Bradley, uh, George, uh, um, General Bradley and we use them as templates for captains in, in Starfleet. But as I've said many times, as everyone knows, the Battle of Midway is my favorite war film of all time. Uh, I could watch that over and over and over. That and Patton are like neck and neck. But they're different. Patton's a personal story set in a war. Midway is a war story procedural. I call them procedurals. It's like this is how the Battle of Midway happened, right? And uh, the beauty of that movie, um, which if you took out all the extraneous stuff about Charlton Heston and his son, which really had nothing to do, you know, it, they just threw in there for human interest. Um, it wasn't even true, but um, they threw that in there. The, everything else in that movie is fascinating. And what's fascinating about the battle of Midway is how much luck played in the United States winning that battle. Yeah. It was luck. It was, you know, and even, you know, you, at the end of the movie, Henry Fonda as, as, Chester Nimitz says it, says, it was freaking luck. You know, we, we just got lucky. You know, we, we found their carriers and they didn't find ours. And uh, that's it. So there's so much. But in that movie, and, and they're redoing Midway's coming out next year. As a matter of fact, one of my friends plays uh, Genda, the, the, air, air, the uh, uh, air group commander for the Japanese. And um, 
so I'm, I'm excited i'm excited that they're redoing it because it's fascinating it's a fast fascinating fascinating battle um we see so anyway that's kind that's kind of it and of course uh I'm lee sully i think lee sully answered this question previously but uh do you guys all know the name of uh charlton heston's uh character in the movie midway i'm going to give you guys a few seconds to answer that question um uh, while, while they're busy pondering that, I will say that if there's one procedural type of film that we'll follow, or that, that uh, we're not following anything, right? We're doing our own thing, but there's something that I think might be an influence, probably the Battle of Britain, because that's oh a, yeah, I it's mean that's classic. literally a, a yeah, and classic uh, film, so, you know. Yeah, and 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 uh, right, sublet got him right. It's Captain Garth. Uh, yeah, Charlton Heston played Captain Garth in Midway. How weird <laughs> is that? And by the way, I grew up on Garth Road, so. A lot of weird shit. <laughs> I, I, followed, I followed Garth Ennis on Hellblazer for my first... Uh, there you go. There's too many Garths in the world. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah. So, you know, Battle of Britain's great. So Battle of Britain, is, and there's a little similarity between Midway and Battle of Britain because yeah. in Midway, I mean, the, the story of the Battle of Britain is the story of courage against incredible odds, right? And there's a little of that in, in... Well, there's a lot of that in Midway. But in Midway, what happened was... Uh, when they were attacking the first Japanese carrier, um, the, I think it was the torpedo bombers went in first um, and pulled all the Japanese air cover down to the deck. And and the, it was basically a suicide mission. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, by pulling all the Japanese air cover down, that first wave that knew they were screwed, um, it allowed the dive bombers to come in and screw up the Japanese royally. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, you know... It's just a it, war. There are so many great stories in war, and it doesn't have to be grand, big, grand battles. It can be one guy trying to survive in a foxhole, right? Yeah, and I think I think you know we've talked then about the the mix, right? So we're looking at procedural elements of it because you're talking about like only the few standing up against the many, or in this case, uh, for Axanar, you know, the people with the not so good ship standing up against, you know. Cling on battle cruisers that they couldn't beat, right? Uh, it's still a similar kind of theme, you know. It's a theme of like uh, believing in yourself, all those kind of things. Um, but at the same time, when you talk about Patton or any of these other characters, this is about a person and about people, right? It's the people that were there, and that's the thing that I feel that we're really bringing into focus with the next couple that we we go and make, you know. Um. So and Necroglobe, ne no Necroglobule says the night witches can get har uh, get hardly any love this side of the iron curtain the night witches were the that was the soviet uh female air corps who flew reconnaissance missions at night wasn't it correct me if i'm wrong there but i think that's that, that's what they were um so yeah so that's another that's a there's so listen so many great stories red tails the story of the tuskegee airmen right yeah. um, the story the story of the um what was the uh, was it the 442nd uh, Infantry Combat Division, which was the Japanese American soldiers yeah. that came out oh, of sorry. the Japanese internment camps? Absolutely. I mean, Listen, you've got you've got you've got some incredible stories in war and some incredible um, acts of heroism. I lived uh, where I live. Uh, my next door neighbor for five years, up until a couple of years ago, was a guy who was on the USS St. Louis when it was bombed at Pearl Harbor. So I went over to interview him. I wanted to talk to him about his experiences. Wonderful old man. Um, my youngest son is named after him because I love the guy so much. And obviously, you know, we have a certain respect in my family for for people with military backgrounds, you know. And uh, when I went over to see Doug, um, he, what a beautiful old man. He had put his bow tie on and his shirt on so that he would look uh, presentable for the camera because he was from then that era we sat and we talked and he said would you like to see a picture of my friend and, and he showed me a picture of his friend um bobby shaw and i said that's great and he's got his arm around bobby the two of them just standing there and uh, then he said yeah he was uh, he was killed about two hours later he was a trumpeter second class on uh the arizona and I'm just, I was sort of overcome. I had a tear in my eye, like, man, I can't believe you you hit me with that, Doug. You know, thanks a bunch. Uh, it's certainly something I won't forget. But when I think about war, I actually tend not to always go to gravitate to these war films. I, I, I tend to think about, you know, I know that my great-grandfather, Bill Eldridge, died 
uh, Aris and he got shot and he, they were going to try and bring him home and he just bled out. And today that would be a nothing injury, but in those days they just couldn't. They, the, the battle was really bad and so he laid there. I'm sure his family at home. Uh, Charlie Hazelgrove was killed on the Somme and they never found him. So, you know, uh, whatever happened to his body was obliterated, presumably. And uh, one of my other great-grandfathers <laughs> uh, died um, two days after the war ended. They were trying to get him home on a train, so they buried him in Ramallah in Palestine. And when I think about that kind of people went somewhere and they gave their lives for a cause, I think real life is so much more interesting at times than anything that we draw from, you know, and I, I want to pull that kind of thing into what we do as well. So I, I tend to think about our craft as filmmakers and storytellers. You know, we're looking at life being the thing that drives what it is that we make. And there's all kinds of technical difficulties and effects that we have to do and all of that. But you, these characters are pulled from people, aren't they? They're not pulled from movies, you know? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. The, listen, I, I certainly enjoy the tactical and strategic aspects of the Battle of Axanar and writing that. But it's way, it's way more interesting to write about the human elements that are happening within that tactical uh, yeah. strategic sphere of, of, of battle and yeah. what's going on is way what's going on with the people is ultimately way more interesting i mean than what's going on with the pew pew ships right right you know, because we, we've all been people that suffered or wondered or were scared right all of us can relate to those people but we can't necessarily relate to a tactical battle map right like we see it so what we concentrate on is we tell those people's stories and then when you cut to the maps and the stuff and the effects you you're flipping out with excitement because it's so cool because it revolves around the people that were there so i think that's really a big focus for us yeah and we're lucky you know earlier on someone's uh you know a little everyone was talking a little bit about richard hatch uh, someone asked, are the next two episodes going to be dedicated to Richard? Yes, of course they are. That almost like goes without saying. Um, w you know, he was such a big influence and an important part of Axnar, uh, Prelude to Axnar, right? Um, and uh, so, we, we, you know, we miss Richard dearly. But um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Richard is, you know, the perfect example of what's great about Prelude to Axnar is that you care about these characters. You like these characters on both both sides. You love Karn, you know, uh, Soval. Everyone's familiar with Soval, so I, we all have a soft spot for him. But uh, all the new characters you've never seen before, Garth, uh, Travis, Alexander, Ramirez, you, we wind up liking them all. Um, because they're compelling characters that are interestingly written and brilliantly acted for the yeah. most part, except that Garth guy. But, you know, brilliantly acted uh, by J.G. Hertzler and Tony Todd and uh, Kate Vernon. Um, you know, it, it's that's that's really what made Axonar great was we wrote characters that were brilliantly acted. And ultimately, when those two things come together, I, I just I just think that's gold. Yeah, I think I think you and I had the privilege of hanging out recently with JG and and Gary, you know, and I got to know Gary a little bit. We had a great conversation at dinner, right? The two of us were just like old mates, you know. And off we go. Let's talk about how we're going to do the work, and and uh, we really hit it off as well. And and you know, I sat for a while listening to JG and Gary talking about how they do what they do and where they pull from and where they've been. Um, uh, Gary's going to be very happy with me because he told me, you know, get a copy of my book on acting. And I was like, man, I'd love to read it. I'd love to know how you think. And um, I accidentally ordered two of them. So I actually have two copies of Gary's book. Uh, so he's going to be very happy with me because I accidentally bought two and like put money in his infernal coffers. But, um, you know, listening to those guys and thinking about where they pull from and what they do, they're so great. They're amazing. They've been doing it for a really long time. And I know that the fans are going to be really excited when they get to see these people. Um, and, and, you know, mate, don't downplay what you did. You know, you did great. Like you are Garth. That's who you, you pulled that guy off. And I'm excited to work with you because I think, you know, my feeling as a director, uh, there's, there's sort of like a thing. I, I certainly said it to Gary and Gary's like, okay, you're in the right place. My job's to protect you guys, right? To make sure that when these characters come to life, they are protected by the director to be as interesting uh, and articulated as they're supposed to be you know so hopefully we can pull that off yeah it's um 
Yeah, you know the I, the the um, someone earlier mentioned Band of Brothers. Yes, Band of Brothers is brilliant. It is brilliant <laughs> because um, it, it really it is a it tells the story of people, right? And that that that's what's so great about it. And um, in those Band of Brothers, if you watch Band of Brothers, you know they have so many interviews with the with the actual people, right? Uh, and um, one of the things we pulled out of that was kind of the look in their eyes the when they talked about things right and what what were they thinking what was going through their head and um i think that was was really really important and that that's kind of what i tried to recreate when i was you know portraying garth was that was that which i thought went very well with what we were saying about him that he's the reluctant hero and 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 what and what you've added so brilliantly to which we won't talk too much about, but is how Garth, what's important to Garth, and what what does he think about, and 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 uh, you know early on, Doc Doctor John Muntrath, who played Doctor McCoy in Star Trek: New Voyages, he was uh, early on was he was the guy I started Axonar with, and um, we were talking about Garth, and uh, I'm sure I told you this uh, already, and. Um, and he said to me, he said, so, um, he said, what are, what is the most important thing to Garth and what is he most afraid of losing? And I said, well, before I answer that question, you answer that question about Captain Kirk. And he said, ah, well, he said, the most important thing to Captain Kirk is the Enterprise, his ship. And his greatest fear is losing the Enterprise. I said, okay. I said, well, Garth, the most important thing to Garth is his crew. And his greatest fear is, is losing one of them. Yeah. Is, 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 you know, and so that really inspired me when thinking of, of when portraying Garth was really focusing on crew, not... You know, it's so easy. Oh, you're captain of a starship. Now nah, you're really the captain of a crew, right? And you've done a great job, as you and I have talked about this, expanding on that concept. And I think that's really, hopefully, that comes through when when we shoot these next two episodes. Well, there's a thing that we, like I say, you, you and I both know, and I guess everybody will find out at some point. But there's a thing that we are doing with Garth that shows why he is the way that he is. And uh, that thing that you mentioned, you know, the thing that he's the most afraid of and what drives him, they're the same thing. They're his crew, you know. Uh, so I think that we've we've really tapped into that. Uh, we're definitely going to tap into it further as we as we make the project. I'm just excited to go do it. No, I'm chomping at the bit, aren't you? You know, let's go make it. You know? Oh, yeah. Let's believe me. I wish I had one hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank right now. Yeah. You know, that's, yep. the, oh, that's the only thing holding us back is is having the money in the bank so we can do it and we have to get get there but by the way i want to th you know listen as we we're talking about um a bunch of you and i'm i'm not going to get get all of you but uh necro Gob uh, globule and uh said nice things about um me portraying garth thank you uh eccleston angel uh i still think alec looks just like the actor who played garth in tos <laughs> um which is funny i you know and thank you eccleston angel i've heard that before um you know Five years ago, I heard, "Hey, you look like a younger version of the guy who played uh, Garth." I don't hear that anymore. But uh, uh, you know, I've heard. I, listen, a couple dozen people have told me they think I look like Steve Inat, and um, it's so funny because I was recently interviewed on another YouTube channel, and uh, one of the questions they said um, is, "Why did you decide to play Garth since you look nothing like him?" <laughs> and, and I was like, "That's the first time anyone's ever said that." But uh, anyway, it's it's an honor to play the role, uh, and it was an honor. Many of you, you you're all going to get the chance to see our interview um, with uh, Linda Alexander, who wrote the biography of uh, Steve Inat, and uh, and um, and Steve's widow. Um, they were at uh, Axicon, and we had a panel with them, and it was really wonderful. And that's all on videotape. Um, the great thing about Axicon was th that we only had like 35, 40 guests of people attend, but we videotaped everything. So now it's like everyone is going to be able to 
see what everyone at Axicon saw, which is outside of the drinking at the bar late at <laughs> night. Sorry, yeah. you guys are screwed. But we had, we had a blast. Uh, make it make it next time. So anyway, thank you all, all of you who said very nice things about um, me. You know, listen, not being an actor, not being a professional actor, uh, it's it it is very it is a struggle. It is for me. It is a it is a challenge. I'll say it's it's a great challenge. It's one I've worked very hard at, and uh, one I you know believe me, you do not want to you know. I know I'm the worst guy on the on the film. I don't want to be the worst guy by a mile, right? You know, I want to be, I want to <coughs> do the best job I can. So thank you all. It's it's great. Uh, you're a great support, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, someone, uh, Silver Bull is asking, hey, when is Axicon 2 going to happen? I want to go. We're not sure, and it won't happen until after we film. That's for sure. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, we don't know. Um, but... but uh, We'll see. Smoky Mirror says, Peter's in, Kurtzman out. You mean Peter's in, Kurtzman, uh, uh, or Peter's in, and Jenkins in, and Kurtzman out. <laughs> um, actually, I, listen, I I don't know if, you know, I think a lot of fans want me to hate Star Trek Discovery, and I just don't. And um, season two, I mean, listen, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful show. And season two is really done some wonderful things. So, um, but I still think Paul and I could do a better job. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, will CBS, uh, Matthew Goodo says, will CBS ever relent on their ironclad guidelines and allow fan films to make full-length episodes again? No clue. Ask them. Um, <laughs> he, most smoky mirrors. Make the fans happy, Alec. Hate it. Say it. I really can't. I just... I know. And you know what? If I hated Discovery and went on a rant week in, week out about how bad it is and this and that, you know, we'd get more YouTube views. Our YouTube channel would be more popular because the channels that hate Star Trek Discovery do a lot better than we do. But I, listen, it's not, I'm not going to lie. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make things up. Hey, have you seen the Orville, Paul? Uh, the Orville? Yeah. Yeah, I've checked it out. Um, I'm not, um, to me, actually, like seeing a show like that is a little bit more of a time dump that I can't afford right now because of work. You know, um, I've seen it. I liked it. It was fun. You know, I really did. Season uh, two is great. Yeah. You and I had a conversation early on in terms of my involvement with this project as well. And it was about like how we are dealing with the fans and, you know, how I feel about other shows and stuff like that. You know, I, I know that Axonar has been this incredible sort of labor of love it's been a success there's also been issues around it and people being kind of mean you know frustrated with it and all these other things that sort of go with it and i told you the way that i was going to be and that wasn't going to change you know if i was going to talk about axanar i was never particularly going down any negative road at all you know i respect uh fans that are frustrated with anything to do with the first um axanar for example i'm like great you know i, I love your passion thank you you know, I genuinely feel that. I'm not going to pay lip service to it. I, I think that fans are the lifeblood of, of what we do. You know, I make a living off of fans. And so I tend to be Mr. Positive. Like, I'm really annoying in that way. Uh, I know I'm driving you crazy, dude, because I'm like so positive about it. No, not I mean, at all. Yeah. I, yeah. I listen, I, you got to leave the negativity. Yeah. Negativity doesn't do anyone any good. Yeah. It really doesn't. You know, it's... it's it's a, it's just a waste of time. I mean, please tell me what positive comes out of anyone's negativity. Nothing for us, right? My, we got one goal, and our goal is to get the project that we're working on make it as amazing as we can. That's the only thing I care about. I really don't care. Uh, yeah, you know, you were talking a little bit earlier on about <clears throat> about about how it'd be to be a starship captain if you're Garth, right? And and there's kind of a thing that people don't understand about like directing, right? I think people might think that it's, it's cool and glamorous because you get to yell action. And frankly, I never yell action anyway. I was at the first AD do it. I could care less about stuff like that. But our, our goal is to build a project uh, that tells a story that we all believe in. And, you know, I think um, that we're, our focus is going to be that and we're going to do a really good job with it. Um, but I don't think that there's any place for us to kind of worry about whether we're doing it right. I don't care if I'm, I'm not going to worry about whether we're doing it right. I'm going to do it right. 
you know, I'm gonna, I expect to do well with it. Yeah, listen, in coaching we say a person does the best of his ability with the resources he has available to him at any given time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, and, and I'm so bullheaded and, uh, you know, driven – and people, you know, a lot of people take that the wrong way. People are like, oh, well, you know, you think you're perfect. No, I'm not perfect. I make more mistakes than you. Whoever is out there saying that, I make more mistakes than you. You know why? Because I take more risks than you do. I do more things than you do. I'm willing to put myself out there and, and fail. And, you know, I look back at Axonar, and this is always the funniest thing, is you, you hear the critics of Axonar, and they, and they, they want to tell you everything that's wrong with the project. And what's funny is, one, they're wrong about everything yeah. because they have no fucking clue what they're talking about, right? Yeah. Two, I know what I did wrong and I did everything I did wrong, I can catalog and tell you what I did wrong. Yeah. I, I know. Every, the thing is, when you enter a new world, when you, as an entrepreneur, every venture I've entered, I've made new mistakes. You think, well, I'm a seasoned entrepreneur, entrepreneur now doesn't matter you're in a new business now if you go and if you go and and you know and you're a movie producer and you produce your second and third movies and you make the same mistakes you're an idiot right there's that saying no one ever learned a lesson from the second kick of a mule (laughs) so right so you've got to learn but when you move from a like when when we opened up my new business we made all sorts of mistakes we never made it in prop works. We never made an Axonar because it was a new business and we didn't know that business, right? But, uh, you know, so I can look back and pray to Axonar, I'll say, and when people says, oh, you shouldn't have made it, you shouldn't have built a movie studio. No, that's not the issue. Building a movie studio is the right decision, right? What, what location we chose was, was the wrong decision. Yeah. That's where we could have made a better decision. So, maybe, maybe, yeah. you, But you never know what's the right decision, man. Like You, you make- don't. Like as a producer, as a director, as an actor, as any of the people that are making a project, you, you better make the decision, right? You don't go second guessing all those decisions. Make the decision first, right? Because most people can't do it. Most people don't want to make that decision. That's what sets us into this business, you know? You gotta make it first. And if you make the wrong one or you fail, great, then fail forwards and fail quickly. You know, that's how we do it. So I'm not that worried about us making the show. You know, we're gonna make a great show. It's it's more um, you know, don't second guess yourself. Don't worry about it. Don't ask us, you know, don't tie in yourself into any question about it. Uh, anything that was negative. If you recall when I first came on, uh, you know, I was immediately hit by people that weren't happy. Uh, you know, maybe they were people who had an ax to grind from whatever was going on, but you see, I'm, I'm outside it because it means nothing to me. I've had nothing to do with it. And so I actually engaged every single one of them in a conversation. I could care less. <laughs> I just, single gripe and i said okay thanks i appreciate it anyway uh we're gonna make a great show from like there's nothing i can really do about anything that happened before all i can do is what we do now and what we're going to do now is awesome so i'm not going to worry about it yeah yeah well, listen one of my biggest critics from from the past has been engaging me in a very positive conversation over the past two months and it's been we've been we enjoy chatting with each other and he was the biggest, one of the biggest assholes uh, to me uh, over the past three years. And we've started chatting. I'm sorry. You've won him over then, haven't you? You Well, you know, listen, I, you know, I said, you, he still says, well, I think you did some things wrong. And I said, tell me what you think I did wrong. Let's have a productive conversation of where you think the errors were. Because it's quite possible that what you think is an error wasn't an error. Or maybe I agree with you. Right. You know, like I said, people said, well, why did you build a studio? We told everyone why we were building a studio. It made total sense to build a studio. The thing I would do differently is I would have done my I would have picked the first place, the place my first director didn't want to go because it was slow rent. I would have built the sets out there. That's what I should have done. Yeah, I shouldn't because that place cost 30 grand a year rather than 250 grand a year. That was so that was the mistake. So when they say, oh, you you shouldn't now. You know, so again, if you're successful and look, I'm 58 years old and like you, I mean, you're a very, very successful creator. I admire everything you get, you do. And I'm sure you can look and back and say, God, I would have done that differently. Oh, I, I would have written that character a little bit differently here. There's always things. If you can't look back and say, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. 
how are you going to learn? You have to be objective well, about you know, you know your your own things. I mean, yeah, you have to know what your strengths are and what what your weaknesses are. But getting back, wasting your time on negativity never helped anyone get anywhere. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the interesting things was uh, because I don't always spend a, you know as much time as I probably uh, as others do on social media, and um, Rob Burnett, our former director, who spends an inordinate amount of time on social media. Um, he was talking to Brian Singer, his friend, the famous movie director, uh, Superman Returns, X Men, whatever, and um, and somehow social media came up, and uh, Brian said, "Rob, you're on social media all the time," and Rob was like, "Yeah, so," and Brian was like, "I'm never on social media," mm-hmm. and Rob was like, "So," and Brian was like, "I'm here, and you're there." Meaning, I'm a successful movie, for, for, you know, director in Hollywood, making tens of millions of dollars every year. You're on social media, so yeah. you, you know, you have to think about things and think about what you do and where you put your time and energy. Spending, wasting my time on social media is wasting my time on social media. Um, the more time I spend on social media, believe me, and I, I will still do it, and I still hate myself for it. But um, negativity, I don't have time for it. I'm too busy. Going to the next, you know, the next finding great people like you to work with, you know. Yeah, well, we're past it now. Like, we'll cast that part of the conversation off. I just felt like, uh, you know, one of the things that's like a big paradigm shift, perhaps for Axe and R now, is that we agreed. Okay, everything's positive. Like, we're going to make something great. We're going to do work really hard. Um, you know, there's no sense in in getting involved in anything anymore. Like, our only approach and the only thing we're going to talk about is what we're going to do next and how we're going to do it. You know, yeah. that's really what I care about. I Warpig Connors, one of our favorites, twenty dollars super chat. Hey, fellas, good to see you. Good to see you, Warpig. Warpig. Warpig Connors. Uh, it just sounds <laughs> like a he needs a he needs a war cry. Warpig. Uh, David S. Sound. Uh, David G. Sound. I'm uh, I'm going to constantly get your name wrong. Uh, Five dollars super chat. Here's some anti-negativity for you. Keep up the great work in chats. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate that. Uh, and that looks... Uh, Smokey Mirror says, Make us cry, make us cheer for Garth. Uh, holding breath. Uh, you know, listen, it's... Um, I I think... Yeah, we'd love you to cheer for Garth. I want you to cheer for everyone, right? Yeah. I, I want... I, I know you're all about character, Paul. Right? And and uh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean I think I think, you know, what people will find out is once they find out what's going on with with other characters, you know, the Klingons. How, why why did they do what they did? Why are they thinking the way that they think? Um, the other Starship captains, how did they how did they go into what does honor mean to the Klingons, you know? What, what, why, what is the, their form of honor? And perhaps they did the right thing in the wrong way. Perhaps they did the right thing the right way as far as they're concerned. Like all of these things are stuff that you and I care about and we're going to make it come out. So it's not really, it's going to revolve around Garth, but it's not just Garth's story. It's literally the story of all the people there. That, that, on both sides. I can't wait for people to see Moreau, the Klingon. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm just like, people are going to shit when they see who this guy is. Yeah. They're gonna, it's a great character. It's great, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's wonderful to go back in, in, into Prelude to Axnor and see the characters and um, and and uh, I mean I, I need to go back constantly go back and watch it like you know every couple of months I got to go back and sit down. Oh, by the way, everyone, uh, we are going to be doing a uh, Prelude to Axnor viewing party um, over here in the next couple of weeks where we're going to watch it together and I will do commentary o- uh, over it um, and uh, then we'll have a chat afterwards talking about it. And we're going to make it real special. And hopefully Paul will join us for that. And, and we'll, we'll talk some. Um, Captain Jesse One says, How aggressive are the Andorians in battle versus the pink-skinned <laughs> human? Oh, oh, how aggressive are the Andorians in battle versus the pink-skinned humans? Um, you know, listen. I'll, let, uh, I'll say this and then I'll let Paul answer. We, you try and make every race unique. Right? And it's kind of like I play Warhammer. So when you play Warhammer, there's space marines and there's the space elves and there's the Necrons, which are like Terminators. And there's the, you know, the, 
all these different tyranids, which are like aliens, right? There's all these races and you have to balance the game, right? You can't just walk, take your space marines and kill another army. The game has to be balanced. The, the, what you do is add character to each army. So this army is a hand-to-hand -hand combat army. This army is a shooty army. This army is really fast. Right? That's how you do it. I, I think it's, that's the way it is in, in creating races uh, 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 in this. is like the Andorians and the Tellarites and the humans and the Klingons. Everyone's just got to have something unique, right? It's not like one's better than the other. Everyone's good at something different. The Vulcans, you know, in our script, the Vulcans are good at, are doing something really important in the script that no one else is doing because they're really good at that. So I don't know. Paul, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I don't want to add much more to what you said, except that we have a moment, don't we? That we know is coming, right, with the Andorians. And there's a thing that happens with them. And I'm like, I can't wait for people to see that because we give them some prominence and there's a thing that they do and something that's really important to the way the battle plays out. And I think it's probably the thing that you would least expect. So, and and listen, when we, you know, I, I've taken the script and I've given it to some of some of our very close fans to read, and yeah, they love it. They're blown away by what we do, and I think that's really important. So, um, uh, listen, and then there's the full script that you know Paul and I are still reworking. Um, uh, I think we, I've told the story that um, in the it, it, when we were when Bill Hunt was working on the script there were certain things that I wanted and but he kind of did his own thing and killed off a character that appears in Axnar. So it's like, I'm sorry, you can't kill that character because he appears 10 years later in the documentary. Um, so uh, I wish you had talked to me before you killed him off. So we have to go back and we had to go back and re rewrite that. And, and the, the idea of Garth's loss is important, but who it, who it, it is changes. But um, the full script is still really, it's something everyone's going to get a chance to see. Paul's going to get to add his Jenkinism to it. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's going to be great because we want to we want to deliver the full script to everyone as well. So you see what it would have been. And we tell the story that way too. Oh, by the way, there's a, there's a Karn story. I, I had commissioned a Karn short story by a, a Star Trek novelist. And... Um, I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to be distributing that to donors as well, which I think will be great once we get Aries Digital up. Uh, let's answer, ask some, answer some questions, Paul. Everyone, ask Paul Jenkins questions, and we will shoot them at him. I'm going to scroll back a little. Uh, is the Prelude Party going to be on YouTube? Uh, yes. Uh, if you're in Atlanta, you can come to my house if you want, maybe. Maybe. Uh, but you got to like dogs, because I've got three and a foster. Um, let's see. What else? Or bring back the Gorn. <laughs> uh, I could see the Tellarites being the heavy torpedo boats, Vulcan the carrier ship crews. Okay, that's an interesting way to go. Um, let's see. For Ah, uh, Black Jess says, is he going to do a page one rewrite because the full script needs it? <laughs> well, I'm not sure what script you saw. You definitely don't, didn't see the, don't, I haven't seen the latest script. Uh, so, uh, no, he's not going to do a, a, a full a page one rewrite. Um, we're just going to tweak it. Uh, there, there, there has never been a, pay, a full page one rewrite of Axon. It's just evolved through many, many, many versions and uh, multiple authors working on it. Um, Paul uh, Paul Jenkins what do you think about shooting the draft of the feature script uh, what do you think about the shooting draft of the feature script he says, uh, what do you uh, think about the shooting draft of the feature script yeah yeah I mean you know you we did the thing I've I, I talked about Axon right uh, we read Prelude uh, you know Prelude right yeah uh, I told you why don't we keep the bits that are great in it like why are we looking at rewriting 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 in a sense that you know it has to be redone from scratch i work in hollywood all the time and i'm tired of people walking in and editing for the sake of editing like what you want to do is keep the stuff that's really good and then try and see if you can work away you know add into it don't make it subtractive and say let's stop or let's start with page one rewrite instead get the pieces that are great and then try to improve on that right absolutely so the approach yeah um 
Someone's asking what kind of guitar you got back there. Oh, uh, that's a Martin back there. I've got about 12 guitars in here at, out of camera. <laughs> um, Matthew Goodall says, how oh, do you deal with mental illness or instability in light of what happened to Garth on TOS? Will you just retcon to be PTSD? Uh, no, um, that's a good question. Uh, we know that you know, at, some point, seeing... at some point there's an accident that happens and it affects Garth. Uh, yeah. um, so um, that's not part of the Axonar story. That happens after the war. That's, um, so, But, you know, does he have PTSD? I, I, you know, listen, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on PTSD. Um, the answer to that question is that that's a discussion that you and I will have about the character when we go through how that character is going to be portrayed. I mean, you know, the question is, no, 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 you don't have to decide all that stuff right now, Alec. Yeah. Right? We, when we get to the work, we sit with the talent, we talk through, you know, the process, for those of you who don't know, you now we go through the process of talking through the character. We, we've written a script. But imagine that you're an actor working on that project and you read the lines and there's just one line that you just is not you. You don't think that's what that person's going to say. You and the director are going to have those conversations about this is what I want to do. And I'm a very collaborative person, so I love the idea of just being allowed the talent to express themselves, you know. Um, but we haven't made those decisions yet. Does he have PTSD? I don't have to make that decision yet. I think that decision gets made when we make the project. Uh, by the way, I, I saw one that I quite like. There's a, a Lynn Marie here asked a question: What's the biggest challenge as a director for Prelude that I didn't expect? Um, I can, you know, that comment's actually a pretty good one. Um, I, I would say the biggest challenge or the challenge is probably the one that I've set myself. Um, you know, when I watched the first Prelude, um, I thought it was great. And then I said, okay, what do we do to, to enhance that or make it, you know, to improve on it, for example? And what I realized was that perhaps the thing that I want to bring to it is, is the idea that when we watch a documentary, a true documentary about war, um, it's very difficult to, to, to really do that when you're acting a documentary. I want our documentary to feel real. These have to be people that talked about being in a place that they already, you know, they were at the Battle of Axanar. So I did a bunch of research on documentaries, on war documentaries and stuff that convey information the way that we're used to. You have to understand that the audience is all going to watch this documentary on Axanar as if they're watching a regular documentary. Um, so to me, it was... How can we accept the challenge of really seeming like an actual documentary? And some of the ways that, that I really want to do it are things like, you know, graphics and maps and things that we often see in documentaries. We're going to go old school at times, which is very counterintuitive for a science fiction piece. You know, we're going to do some old school kind of stuff. And I think that's a real challenge, but I, I really believe in it. You know? Great. Um... Limery is one of our, our favorites and one of our regulars. Um, uh, um, ah, here's a good one for you. When do you think you're going to be ready to storyboard the script? Uh, well, uh, right now, as you know, you sly devil, because that's what we're that's what we're working on right now. Um, you know, we're ready with it. We love the script. Um, there's some things that I always think need need work. Um, we, we like to iterate on the script. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. There's a few things that I'd like to there's a few things that I'd like to change, um, but they're nothing big. I mean, we've got our story. We know what we're going to do. Um, so we are currently working on the storyboarding. There you go, Scott. I think that's Scott Point. Um, Smoky Mirror says, can you hire a real BBC narrator to stand in for John Gill? <laughs> uh, Orion Zakaba, who is John Gill in Prelude to Axonar, is chomping at the bit to do it again. He, uh, so uh, he will be narrating once again. Um, uh, yeah, Orlando Bloom is not busy, I hear. Come on, Paul Jenkins, get on the phone. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, there's plenty. Of, there's plenty of people that are not busy, but there's also plenty of people that are not appropriate. So there, there you go. Um, let's see. What uh, anyone? Anyone else have questions for Paul before we wrap up? 
Um, uh, will the Aries get a TMP refit? Well, again, after this, after this, that's a ways in the future. That's a good 20 years in the future. So uh, not really. Look at that beautiful ship. Why was it? Why would you need a refit? Look at those. Those are mighty substantial nacelles, don't you think? Um, I, I, this, by the way, this is my favorite shot of the Aries. Um, of course, that is a uh, Tobias Richter uh, image of the uh, Aries in dry dock. And it is my, I think that's the money shot of the Aries, that, that angle from below, because, I don't know, it looks really mean to me. <laughs> it looks very, very aggressive. So, um, and... <laughs> How do we explain Khan's absence in Axanar? That was the one I was looking for. Okay. Uh, well, how about, I don't know, do you want to address that or should I? Like, I, what if we said that the answer to that question is going to make you very happy with us, I would think, or impressed? Hopefully we have a great approach to that. Uh, I certainly, I, you and I have had a couple of discussions about that, Alec, and it's something that we're pretty passionate about. So we're not going to give away how we're going to do it or what we're going to do, but I will tell you that people will be surprised. Yeah. I think there's, there's, uh, I have always imagined, uh, because of Richard's passing, um, there is a scene at some point, Karn's going to die at some point in the story. Maybe not in what the story we're telling, but in the future, who knows? And um, I really want to film the scene in the set we have. We have the captain's quarter set. I want to film the scene where Garth finds out Karn's dead. Um, I really do want to film that scene because I I think there's um, I think especially at the end of the full script when you finally read the full script to Axnar, there's a moment with Garth and Karn. And um, I think these two, these two uh, generals have, uh, a, a, you know, a, a significant amount of respect for each other. Maybe they even became friendly, right? And so I think that it would be a, a great homage to Richard to film the scene where Garth finds out that Karn is dead. Uh, and, uh, I've always imagined, and I ima already imagine that scene. I mean, I just, I, I see Garth getting, and again, who knows, this may happen 10 years after Axnar, right? Um, and maybe Garth's in charge of the Constitution at that point. But I think Garth gets the news, and I think there's, I don't, I think there's a moment there for Garth. I think it's a moment we need to see. We need to see how Garth reacts to that, because, um, I, I have like a vague feeling about the way he would react to it, but I really want to see that. And I think it would be a great way to let everyone know that, that Karn's on his way to Stova Core. Um, because I think that Karn, if I may, I mean, I've kind of imagined that Karn gets assassinated, right? Because this is, and somehow it's Chang's fault, right? You know, I, as you see Chang in, in, in the full script, you see him as Korn's mentor, but you see him as very ambitious. I've always said that when you see Axnar, the full script, it totally informs Star Trek VI. You're going to see Star Trek VI and go, oh, okay, I get it now. That's Chang, and this happened, and this happened, right? And this is what, and, and in many ways, what happens in the script of Axnar is why Chang is who he is in Star Trek VI. Because I love Christopher Plummer. He's so amazing. He's my second favorite or third favorite Klingon after Richard and Michael and Sarah. Um, but I also imagine that if Karn was assassinated, he took like a dozen assassins with him, right? So I want to see this. I want to see this this picture, like this, you know, surveillance camera picture of like twelve Klingon bodies strewn all around, and and there's Karn with a you know. He's got a, a, the dagger in one Klingon and a knife in his back. and um, But there's like this just scene of ultimate carnage because even it took that many Klingons to take Karn down. Um, and I think it just kind of be like a fitting a fitting capstone to the Karn character and to Richard. I, I think it'd be I think Richard would appreciate that. So there you go.
I don't I don't know if we, you think about that. <laughs> I oh. say, mine. I say nothing. Say <laughs> because you know what I you know what I'm aiming towards. You know exactly which part of what we're doing I'm excited about. So, yeah. No, I'm it, excited about it too. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, 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 let's see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Michael S. Carter again. Uh, another twenty dollars super chat. Thank you, Michael. Gentlemen, Alex slash Paul. Well, thank you for n letting us know that you consider us both gentlemen, <laughs> or else we'd be guessing who you were talking to. The commander in chief of this house, wife, has issued new orders. Bed transporting out. Thanks immensely, Mr. Jenkins, for sharing some fantastic stories tonight. Alex, thanks as always. Keep up the good fight, bro. Hey. Michael S. Carter, live long and prosper. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. You're a fantastic fan, and, and you honor us by joining us every week. Um, and then uh, Ray Gun Media Productions says, but if this is a documentary years after the fact, we've seen that Karn survived the war to tell the tale, right? Yes. Yes. Karn... I kind of see Prelude as happening 10 years after the end of, of the, the feature film script, right? Because it took like five years to get the peace. The peace conference is like five years after the end of the war. Um, that's where they signed, finally signed the peace. And then Prelude's like five years. So I always imagine it like 10 years later. So yeah, so Karn's alive 10 years after the war. He didn't die in the war. So if that's kind of what you're, what you're asking, uh, that is, that's right. Uh, um, Still need help working on the set, right? Sublet says yes. Just message me on Facebook. Um, Necroglobule says I'm not kidding. The Ares is up there with the actual Grand Dom herself. The Enterprise, as far as gorgeous trick ships go. Thank you, uh, Necro. Thank you for that. And listen, I agree with you. I mean, look at that ship. That that is fucking gorgeous. That ship is just stunning. And uh, so. Uh, you know, that is the product of, of Sean Tarnjo, um, myself and Tobias Richter, you know, everyone's, uh, we did the, please go back and watch the episode on designing the Aries. It tells you how we came up with the ship, but, uh, I basically had my ideas, what I wanted to look like. And I threw ideas at Sean and he drew it out and drew it out and drew it out and kept refining it. And then we sent it to, to Tobias and boom, he brought it to life. It was amazing. So thank you. Um, Okay. Did you guys ever read the Star Trek Early Voyages comics? No. Uh, I must admit, no. No, I, I've seen them, and they look yeah. really interesting. Um, but no, please uh, fill us in on them. Um, how about an Easter egg with the USS Hatch in honor of Richard Hatch? Uh, or how about a Klingon ship named Richard Hatch in Klingon? That might be interesting, right? Paul Jenkins, what what do you see the Ares class doing in peacetime? I hope not totally decommissioned. Same as the Enterprise, I would think. You know, go go find some stuff. There's plenty <laughs> out there. That's what I would do with it, wouldn't you? Yeah, I you know I've kind of yeah. It's people have asked me, and my my first thing they always say they're like on border patrol duty because they're not outfitted as science <laughs> ships, right? So like after the war, they're like. Go patrol the neutral zone. So so the best part of that is, you know, what I say uh, uh, is, uh, wow, let's go, you know, find a bunch of undiscovered stars and go see what's around them. And, and presumably meet a, a lot of very attractive aliens and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, then, and make friends with them, right? Uh, your version, which I actually really prefer because this is much more realistic, is, all right, now the war's over. You're on border patrol duty. Like, it's the most boring thing that you've ever done in your life. And you're out there for six years, literally on the border doing nothing. That's that's the worst fate of the Aries. That's literally the worst thing that could happen. But actually, it's the most realistic thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Aries itself is probably in the Fleet Museum. I, you know, they would take the Aries and put it in the Fleet Museum. Um, yeah. All the other sh poor ship, poor Aries class ships. Um, uh, will the Aries w wind up in the Smithsonian? Yes, exactly. Um uh, Marvel Comics put out a Captain Pike series in the 90s. Um, oh. Old Code. Alec, did you ever get the goodie I sent you? You need. I need more information. I'm not sure what goodie you sent. Um, and I'm not sure the dogs didn't eat it. <laughs> so, so let me know. Um, 
War, War Pig Connors is with you. Yep. Yeah, he says, go find some stuff. That's right. War Pig. That's right. You and me, War Pig. We, I love the exploration, you know, new discovery, and first contact stuff. Um, would you consider having David per Paris on to talk about his space compression device? It is basically one half of a warp drive. Uh, sure. Why not? Um, you guys, <laughs> farce as odd. You guys look like chatty youngsters. That's because <laughs> we're mates, Forrest. Like we like, Alec and I actually like hanging out and doing stuff as well. So, you know, we found the best, did we not find the best ice cream place in the world? Oh my God. Uh, I know. Yes, I think one of our one of our meetings was at. Uh, you tell them. Well, we found this. We found this place that sells ice cream that's got alcohol in it, and we thought, well, how how potent could it be? And I'm like, it's pretty potent, right? Oh uh, yeah, it's pretty potent stuff. And we went there and we ate like ice cream and probably put on about twenty pounds each. That that ice cream is great, but a place with alcoholic ice cream, that is the well single greatest experience we've had so far and it was it the first or the second time we went there and we went there right as they were opening and they had just finished doing a photo shoot for their menu yes and one of their items was this huge goblet it must have had 20 scoops of ice cream in it and they brought it out to us because we were the first customers through the door and they brought it out to us and said look guys this is on the house we just yeah. we just shot it for the menu and we I were like literally, i had literally just said I don't want any ice cream today because I really just feel like some, you know, a cup of coffee. And they brought out 20 things of ice cream. So I guess we're sort of bonding over uh, the, the best alcoholic ice cream in the, in the country. And you took like five scoops back to your kids. I did. I just took them back to the kids because I couldn't eat all that stuff. But the kids uh. were happy about it. T to me, uh, when someone says, you, you guys look like a couple of chatty youngsters, I'm like, great. That's what it's going to be like working together. That's what we're, That's the energy hopefully we bring to what we do, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I, absolutely. I, I mean, we're here to have fun, man. I'm not going to do this if it ain't fun. I'm not going to yeah. do it with people I don't like having fun with. Um, yeah. Uh, so, as we wrap things up, um, Captain Spire, good night. Sorry about the super chat thing. Oh, was there a super chat problem? I don't know. Um, let me know. Um, old code. Alec, it was a clip of the new sound effects and music. Oh, I have new sound effects and music. Oh, the, is that the one I saw? That Did I respond to you about that? I hope so. Um, wish R Richard was still here. He's a great guest. No disrespect, Paul. No. Hey, he'd be a much better guest than I would be. Well, yeah. I, 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 hey, listen, he, I certainly wouldn't be talking as much because Richard never would shut up. Yeah. He, was, he, he was great. He just, you could just drop a token in him and go. And I, I could have just sat back here and just, you know, play could play games on my phone for two hours, and Richard would have told you the history of <laughs> Karn and all his family. It was just amazing. Uh, and yes, Lynn, uh, alcohol ice cream for the kids. Absolutely right. Hey, listen, how else do you think I'm going to get them to sleep? <laughs> exactly. Um, Alec, will you have studio tours? We always have studio tours. If you're in town, someone just messaged me this weekend about – and unfortunately, it was like at the last second. It was like Saturday morning. They're like, Alec, are you going to be here on Saturday so we can come to the, you know, to the studio? Well, sad, sad, that was a tough day. We we, we were busy transporting a, a foster dog. Um, give me some heads up. Uh, fans are always welcome at the studio to see the bridge and everything. Um, give me some heads up, like a week, please, so I can schedule. Because if it's not me, Dana Wagner... There's like four people that have uh, keys to the studio. Crystal um, and Dale Simpson, our head of security. They can all give everyone a tour uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the studio, and we want you to. Excuse me, your fans and donors, come on, come on out. Uh, we, we'd love you, love you to see it. Um, a week, thirty days, please. I'm not sure what Stogie's saying. So. Um, yeah, uh, Eccleston Angel, where are you located? Are you local or are you in the south or wherever? Um, Starbuck was the awesome Han Solo of Galactica. Okay, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, all right, last comments, guys, before we sign off. 
Um, listen, Paul, thank you. I This has been great. I've had a great time. I hope your wife isn't going to be mad at me for taking two hours of your time. Um, <laughs> no, uh, she, loved, she loves you, buddy. Uh, I, listen, I love this. This is great. This kind of energy. I love hearing people say you look like a couple of giddy kids. It's like, yeah, that's how we're going to work on the project. So, you know, people should be excited about that. We're, we're, we're friends and we are going to put together but you know all bets are off once we get to work man because we're not friends then we're working together to make something you know my what's uh, what's my college lecture say you're not the boss dude you're not i'm not the boss either the boss is what we make that's my boss the work dictates the yeah. work dictates uh ray, ray gun media productions are you going to use ray tessie's set as alternate starships um haven't discussed it with ray um possibly We'll see what we'll see what the needs of the production are. Uh, it's a nice resource. Uh, that's the TOS sets down in Kingston, Georgia, Kingsland, Georgia, which is five hours southeast of us. Um, <clears throat> I would love to shoot on those sets someday. Th that'd be awesome. I, I mean, I had a great time when I was shooting on Star Trek: New Voyager sets, um, which you will finally see because I finally have the footage uh, uh, from from that. I want to finish that too. Oh, Paul, you and I need to talk about that. Um, I've got the hard drives here, so um, we'll get to it one day. Um, and then uh, uh, Dewey Spring, looking forward to your collaboration and a great storyline. Thanks. Thank you. Eccleston Angel uh, is in... Uh, oh, Eccleston Angel, uh, you're in upstate New York, and you uh, in the winter you live in Myrtle Beach. Well, I was just in Myrtle Beach last weekend, Eccleston Angel, I uh, work Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in Charleston, it's an hour and a half away. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you're about five hours from the sets, but you'll definitely need to contact me on Facebook, and you need to come up and see the sets for sure. Um, and uh, you guys should you guys should rent time on the Walking Dead sets. <laughs> I know the guy. I know Why? the guy. I know the guy that owns the town, so maybe we can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Small. Uh, also reuse the sets to redress for other ships. Yeah. Listen, what, once we, once we, uh, here, here's the thing, uh, our, kind of our final thought before we sign off. Once we get certain things in order, once we get Aries digital up, once donors start seeing perks again, we start raising money, then we can start shooting. Once we start shooting and showing you guys what we're shooting, you're going to want to give us more money to shoot more and we will, we'll keep shooting. So believe me, there's lots and lots of stuff for us to do. And we're excited to do it, and um, think the things are finally lining up for us. So there we go. Uh, I'm going to say thank you to all the fans right now uh, who've come out to, to see us and to to chat with us tonight. Thank you very much for opening your hearts to Paul and welcoming him to 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 the team. Paul, thanks as always, dude. I mean, I, you know, I know we're only like an hour away from. No, we're not even out. How how far are we? Fifty, forty-five minutes away from each other. Minutes. Yeah, something like that. I know I'm only a half hour from the ice cream. <laughs> Let's do it, man. So so thank you very much uh, all, to all our fans. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a great Axonar Confidential. We will have another one next week, next Monday, as always. In the meantime, there'll be a real Trek um, video going up. And as always, Real Trek on Fridays, Action Our Confidential on Mondays. That is our schedule right now. And we'll be throwing up some more videos in between. So keep checking back. And once again, because Jonathan Lane will kill me if I don't say it, please donate to the Aries Studio um, Patreon campaign. Uh, go to uh, Patreon slash Aries Studios. Whatever you can donate, they're all different levels. You support us every month. We give you unique content. The blueprints of the Aries are going up on uh, right now f uh, for everyone. Uh, we've got exclusive videos going up. We have exclusive chats over there. So it is uh, all meant to th a thank you, to help support the studio and thank you for doing so. So thank you very much. Thank you to all our fans. Um, and once again, I'm Alec Peters. This is the amazing Paul Jenkins. And uh, until next time, everyone live long and prosper. Cheers.